are you? He demanded in a loud tone, as if its sound alone would banish the presence of this being that seemed to him at this moment to be the production of all the enchantments of evil spirits. She raised herself and cried in a voice that seemed to come from the agony of a human being. Do you not know me, me, whom you married a few hours since under the shuppie marriage canopy to a husband? On hearing this familiar voice, the rabbi stood speechless. He gazed at the young woman. Now, indeed, he must regard her as one bereft of reason, rather than as a specter. Well, if you are she, he stammered out after a pause, for it was with difficulty that he found words to answer. Why are you here and not in the place where you belong? I know no other place to which I belong more than here where I now am, she answered severely. These words puzzled the rabbi still more. Is it really an insane woman before him? He must have thought so, for he now addressed her in a gentle tone of voice, as we do those suffering from this kind of sickness, in order not to excite her, and said, the place where you belong, my daughter, is in the house of your parents, and, since you have today been made a wife, your place is in your husband's house. The young woman muttered something which failed to reach the rabbi's ear, yet he only continued to think that he saw before him some poor unfortunate whose mind was deranged. After a pause, he added, in a still gentler tone, What is your name then, my child? God, God, she moaned in the greatest anguish. He does not even yet know my name. How should I know you? He continued apologetically, for I am a stranger in this place. This tender remark seemed to have produced the desired effect upon her excited mind. My name is Vale, she said quietly after a pause. The rabbi quickly perceived that he had adopted the right tone towards his mysterious guest. Vale, he said, approaching nearer her, what do you wish of me? Rabbi, I have a great sin resting heavily upon my heart, she replied despondently. I do not know what to do. What can you have done? inquired the rabbi with a tender look. That cannot be discussed at any other time than just now. Will you let me advise you, Vale? No, no, she cried again violently. I will not be advised. I see I know what oppresses me. Yes, I can grasp it by the hand. It lies so near before me. Is that what you call to be advised? Very well, returned the rabbi seeing that this was the very way to get the young woman to talk. Very well, I say. You are not imagining anything. I believe that you have greatly sinned. Have you come here then to confess this sin? Do your parents or your husband know anything about it? Who is my husband? She interrupted him impetuously. Thoughts welled up in the rabbi's heart like a tumultuous sea in which opposing conjectures cross and recross each other's course. Should he speak with her as with an ordinary sinner? Were you perhaps forced to be married? He inquired as quietly as possible after a pause. A suppressed sob, a strong inward struggle manifesting itself in the whole trembling body was the only answer to this question. Tell me, my child, said the rabbi encouragingly. In such tones as the rabbi had never before heard, so strange, so surpassing any human sounds, the young woman began. Yes, rabbi, I will speak, even though I know that I shall never go from this place alive, which would be the very best thing for me. No, rabbi, I was not forced to be married. My parents have never once said to me, you must, but my own will, my own desire, rather, 
has always been supreme. My husband is the son of a rich man in the community. To enter his family was to be made the first lady in the gas, to sit buried in gold and silver. And that very thing, nothing else, was what infatuated me with him. It was for that that I forced myself, my heart and will, to be married to him, hard as it was for me. But in my innermost heart I detested him. The more he loved me, the more I hated him. But the gold and silver had an influence over me. More and more they cried to me, You will be the first lady in the gas. Continue, said the rabbi when she ceased, almost exhausted by these words. What more shall I tell you, rabbi? She began again. I was never a liar when a child or older, and yet during my whole engagement it has seemed to me as if a big, gigantic lie had followed me step by step. I have seen it on every side of me. But today, when I stood under the chape, Rabbi and he took the ring from his finger and put it on mine. And when I had to dance at my own wedding with him, whom I now recognized now for the first time as the lie, and when they led me away. This sincere confession escaping from the lips of the young woman, she sobbed aloud and bowed her head still deeper over her breast. The rabbi gazed upon her in silence. No insane woman ever spoke like that. Only a soul conscious of its own sin, but captivated by a mysterious power, could suffer like this. It was not sympathy which he felt with her. It was much more living over the sufferings of the woman. In spite of the confused story, it was all clear to the rabbi. The cause of the flight from the father's house at this hour also required no explanation. I know what you mean, he longed to say, but he could only find words to say. Speak further, Vale. The young woman turned towards him. He had not yet seen her face. The golden hood with the shading lace hung deeply over it. Have I not told you everything, she said with a flush of scorn. Everything, repeated the rabbi inquiringly. He only said this moreover through embarrassment. Do you tell me now, she cried, at once passionately and mildly, what am I to do? Vel, exclaimed the rabbi, entertaining now for the first time a feeling of repugnance for this confidential interview. Tell me now, she pleaded, and before the rabbi could prevent it, the young woman threw herself down at his feet and clasped his knees in her arms. This hasty act had loosened the golden wedding hood from her head, and thus exposed her face to view, a face of remarkable beauty. So overcome was the young rabbi by the sight of it that he had to shade his eyes with his hands, as if before a sudden flash of lightning. Tell me now, what shall I do? She cried again. Do you think that I have come from my parents' home merely to return again without help? You alone in the world must tell me. Look at me. I have kept all my hair just as God gave it me. It has never been touched by the shears. Should I then do anything to please my husband? I am no wife. I will not be a wife. Tell me, tell me, what am I to do? Arise, arise, bade the rabbi. But his voice quivered, sounded almost painful. Tell me first, she gasped. I will not rise till then. How can I tell you? He moaned, almost inaudibly. Naphtali, shrieked the kneeling woman. But the rabbi staggered backward. The room seemed ablaze before him like a bright fire. A sharp cry rang from his breast, as if one suffering from some painful wound had been seized by a rough hand. In his hurried attempt to free himself from the embrace of the young woman 
who still clung to his knees. It chanced that her head struck heavily against the floor. Naftali, she cried once again. Silence, silence, groaned the rabbi, pressing both hands against his head. And still again she called out this name, but not with that agonizing cry. It sounded rather like a commingling of exultation and lamentation, and again he demanded, Silence! Silence! But this time so imperiously, so forcibly, that the young woman lay on the floor as if conjured, not daring to utter a single word. The rabbi paced almost wildly up and down the room. There must have been a hard, terrible struggle in his breast. It seemed to the one lying on the floor that she heard him sigh from the depths of his soul. Then his pacing became calmer, but it did not last long. The fierce conflict again assailed him. His step grew hurried. It echoed loudly through the awful stillness of the room. Suddenly he neared the young woman, who seemed to lie there scarcely breathing. He stopped in front of her. Had anyone seen the face of the rabbi at this moment, the expression on it would have filled him with terror. There was a marvelous tranquility overlying it, the tranquility of a struggle for life or death. Listen to me now, Vale, he began slowly. I will talk with you. I listen, rabbi, she whispered, but do you hear me well? Only speak she returned. But will you do what I advise you? Will you not oppose it? For I am going to say something that will terrify you. I will do anything that you say. Only tell me, she moaned. Will you swear? I will, she groaned. No, do not swear yet, until you have heard me, he cried. I will not force you. This time came no answer. Hear me then, daughter of Reuben Gladner, he began after a pause. You have a twofold sin upon your soul, and each is so great, so criminal, that it can only be forgiven by severe punishment. First, you permitted yourself to be infatuated by the gold and silver, and then you forced your heart to lie. With the lie you sought to deceive the man, even though he had entrusted you with his all when he made you his wife. A lie is truly a great sin. Streams of water cannot drown them. They make men false and hateful to themselves. The worst that has been committed in the world was led in by a lie. That is the one sin. I know, I know, sobbed the young woman. Now hear me further began the rabbi again with a wavering voice after a short pause. You have committed a still greater sin than the first. You have not only deceived your husband, but you have also destroyed the happiness of another person. You could have spoken and you did not. For life you have robbed him of his happiness, his light, his joy, but you did not speak. What can he now do when he knows what has been lost to him? Naftali, cried the young woman. Silence, silence. Do not let that name pass your lips again, he demanded violently. The more you repeat it, the greater becomes your sin. Why did you not speak when you could have spoken? God can never easily forgive you that. To be silent keep secret in one's breast what would have made another man happier than the mightiest monarch. Thereby you have made him more than unhappy. He will never more have the desire to be happy. Veil, God in heaven cannot forgive you for that. Silence, silence, groaned the wretched woman. No, Veil, he continued with a stronger voice. Let me talk now. You are certainly willing to hear me speak. Listen to me. You must do severe penance for this sin, the twofold sin which rests upon your head. God is
is long-suffering and merciful, he will perhaps look down upon your misery and will blot out your guilt from the great book of transgressions. But you must become penitent. Hear now what it shall be. The rabbi paused. He was on the point of saying the severest thing that had ever passed his lips. You were silent, Vale, then he cried, when you should have spoken. Be silent now forever to all men and to yourself. From the moment you leave this house until I grant it, you must be dumb. You dare not let a loud word pass from your mouth. Will you undergo this penance? I will do all you say, moaned the young woman. Will you have strength to do it? he asked gently. I shall be as silent as death, she replied. And one thing more I have to say to you, he continued. You are the wife of your husband. Return home and be a Jewish wife. I understand you, she sobbed in reply. Go to your home now and bring peace to your parents and husband. The time will come when you may speak, when your sin will be forgiven you. Till then bear what has been laid upon you. May I say one thing more, she cried, lifting up her head. Speak, he said, Naphtali. The rabbi covered his eyes with one hand, with the other motioned her to be silent. But she grasped his hand, drew it to her lips. Hot tears fell upon it. Go now, he sobbed, completely broken down. She let go the hand. The rabbi had seized the candle, but she had already passed him and glided through the dark hall. The door was left open. The rabbi locked it again. Vale returned to her home as she had escaped unnoticed. The narrow street was deserted, as desolate as death. The searchers were to be found everywhere except there where they ought first to have sought for the missing one. Her mother, Zelda, still sat on the same chair on which she had sunk down an hour ago. The fright had left her like one paralyzed, and she was unable to rise. What a wonderful contrast to this wedding room, with the mother sitting alone in it, presented to the hilarity reigning here shortly before. On Vale's entrance, her mother did not cry out. She had no strength to do so. She merely said, So you have come at last, my daughter. As if Vale had only returned from a walk somewhat too long. But the young woman did not answer to this and similar questions. Finally, she signified by gesticulations that she could not speak. Fright seized the wretched mother a second time and the entire house was filled with her lamentations. Reuben Kladner and Vale's husband, having now returned from their fruitless search, were horrified on perceiving the change which Vale had undergone. Being men, they did not weep. With staring eyes they gazed upon the silent young woman and beheld in her an apparition which had been dealt with by God's visitation in a mysterious manner. From this hour began the terrible penance of the young woman. The impression which Vale's woeful condition made upon the people of the gas was wonderful. Those who had danced with her that evening on the wedding now first recalled her excited state. Her wild actions were now first remembered by many. It must have been an evil eye, they concluded, a jealous evil eye to which her beauty was hateful. This alone could have possessed her with a demon of unrest. She was driven by this evil power into the dark night, a sport of these malicious potencies which pursue men step by step especially on such occasions. The living God alone knows what she must have seen that night. Nothing good, else one would not become dumb. 
Old legends and tales were revived, each more horrible than the other. Hundreds of instances were given to prove that this was nothing new in the gas. Despite this explanation, it is remarkable that the people did not believe that the young woman was dumb. The most thought that her power of speech had been paralyzed by some awful fright, but that with time it would be restored. Under this supposition they called her Veil the Silent. There is a kind of human eloquence more telling, more forcible than the loudest words, than the choicest diction, the silence of woman. Oft times they cannot endure the slightest vexation, but some great heartbreaking sorrow, some pain from constant renunciation, self-sacrifice, they suffer with sealed lips, as if in very truth they were bound with bars of iron. It would be difficult to fully describe that long, silent life of the young woman. It is almost impossible to cite more than one incident. Vale accompanied her husband to his home, that house resplendent with that gold and silver which had infatuated her. She was, to be sure, the first woman in the gas. She had everything in abundance. Indeed, the world supposed that she had but little cause for complaint. Must one have everything, was sometimes queried in the gas. One has one thing, another another. And, according to all appearances, the people were right. Vale continued to be the beautiful, blooming woman. Her penance of silence did not deprive her of a single charm. She was so very happy indeed that she did not seem to feel even the pain of her punishment. Vale could laugh and rejoice, but never did she forget to be silent. The seemingly happy days, however, were only qualified to bring about the proper time of trials and temptations. The beginning was easy enough for her, the middle and end were times of real pain. The first years of their wedded life were childless. It is well, the people in the Gassi said, that she has no children, and God has rightly ordained it to be so. A mother who cannot talk to her child, that would be something awful. Unexpectedly to all, she rejoiced one day in the birth of a daughter. And when that affectionate young creature, her own offspring, was laid upon her breast, and the first sounds were uttered by its lips, that nameless, eloquent utterance of an infant, she forgot herself not. She was silent. She was silent also when from day to day that child blossomed before her eyes into fuller beauty. Nor had she any words for it when, in effusions of tenderness, it stretched forth its tiny arms, when in burning fever it sought for the mother's hand. For days, yes, weeks, together she watched at its bedside. Sleep never visited her eyes, but she ever remembered her penance. Years fled by. In her arms, she carried another child. It was a boy. The father's joy was great. The child inherited its mother's beauty. Like its sister, it grew in health and strength. The noblest, richest mother, they said, might be proud of such children. And Vale was proud, no doubt, but this never passed her lips. She remained silent about things which mothers in their joy often cannot find words enough to express. And although her face many times lighted up with beaming smiles, yet she never renounced the habitual silence imposed upon her. The idea that the slightest dereliction of her penance would be accompanied with a curse upon her children may have impressed itself upon her mind. Mothers will understand better than other persons what this mother suffered from her penalty of silence. Thus a part of those years sped away, which we are wont to call the best. 
she still flourished in her wonderful beauty. Her maiden daughter was beside her, like the bud beside the full-blown rose. Suitors were already present from far and near, who passed in review before the beautiful girl. The most of them were excellent young men, and any mother might have been proud in having her own daughter sought by such. Even then, Vale did not undo her penance. Those busy times of intercourse which keep mothers engaged in presenting the superiorities of their daughters in the best light were not allowed her. The choice of one of the most favored suitors was made. Never before did any couple in the gas equal this in beauty and grace. A few weeks before the appointed time for the wedding, a malignant disease stole on, spreading sorrow and anxiety over the greater part of the land. Young girls were principally its victims. It seemed to pass scornfully over the aged and infirm. Vale's daughter was also laid hold upon by it. Before three days had passed, there was a corpse in the house, the bride. Even then, Vale did not forget her penance. When they bore away the corpse to the good place, she did utter a cry of anguish which long after echoed in the ears of the people. She did wring her hands in despair, but no one heard a word of complaint. Her lips seemed dumb forever. It was then, when she was seated on the low stool in the seven days of mourning, that the rabbi came to her to bring to her the usual consolation for the dead. But he did not speak with her. He addressed words only to her husband. She herself dared not look up. Only when he turned to go did she lift her eyes. They, in turn, met the eyes of the rabbi, but he departed without a farewell. After her daughter's death, Vale was completely broken down. Even that which at her time of life is still called beauty had faded away within a few days. Her cheeks had become hollow, her hair gray. Visitors wondered how she could endure such a shock, how body and spirit could hold together. They did not know that that silence was an iron fetter firmly imprisoning the slumbering spirits. She had a son, moreover, to whom, as to something last and dearest, her whole being still clung. The boy was thirteen years old. His learning in the Holy Scriptures was already celebrated for miles around. He was the pupil of the rabbi, who had treated him with a love and tenderness becoming his own father. He said that he was a remarkable child, endowed with rare talents. The boy was to be sent to Hungary, to one of the most celebrated teachers of the times, in order to lay the foundation for his sacred studies under this instructor's guidance and wisdom. Years might perhaps pass before she would see him again, but Vail let her boy go from her embrace. She did not say a blessing over him when he went. Only her lips twitched with the pain of silence. Long years expired before the boy returned from the strange land, a full-grown, noble youth. When Vale had her son with her again, a smile played about her mouth, and for a moment it seemed as if her former beauty had enjoyed a second spring. The extraordinary ability of her son already made him famous. Wheresoever he went, people were delighted with his beauty and admired the modesty of his manner, despite such great scholarship. The next Sabbath, the young disciple of the Talmud, scarcely twenty years of age, was to demonstrate the first marks of this great learning. Crowded shoulder to shoulder in this great synagogue. Curious glances were cast through the lattice work of the women's gallery above upon the dense throng. 
Vale occupied one of the foremost seats. She could see everything that took place below. Her face was extremely pale. All eyes were turned towards her. The mother, who was permitted to see such a day for her son. But Vale did not appear to notice what was happening before her. A weariness such as she had never felt before, even in her greatest suffering, crept over her limbs. It was as if she must sleep during her son's address. He had hardly mounted the stairs before the Ark of the Laws, hardly uttered his first words, when a remarkable change crossed her face. Her cheeks burned. She arose. All her vital energy seemed aroused. Her son, meanwhile, was speaking down below. She could not have told what he was saying. She did not hear him. She only heard the murmur of approbation, sometimes low, sometimes loud, which came to her ears from the quarters of the men. The people were astonished at the noble bearing of the speaker, his melodious speech, and his powerful energy. When he stopped at certain times to rest, it seemed as if one were in a wood swept by a storm. She could now and then hear a few voices declaring that such a one had never before been listened to. The women at her side wept. She alone could not. A choking pain pressed from her breast to her lips. Voices were astir in her heart which struggled for expression. The whole synagogue echoed with buzzing voices. But to her it seemed as if she must speak louder than these. At the very moment her son had ended, she cried out unconsciously, violently throwing herself against the lattice work. God, living God, shall I not now speak? A dead silence followed this outcry. Nearly all had recognized this voice as that of the silent woman. A miracle had taken place. Speak, speak, resounded the answer of the rabbi from the men's seats below. You may now speak. But no reply came. Vale had fallen back into her seat, pressing both hands against her breast. When the women sitting beside her looked at her, they were terrified to find that the silent woman had fainted. She was dead. The unsealing of her lips was her last moment. Long years afterwards, the rabbi died. On his deathbed, he told those standing about him this wonderful penance of veil. Every girl in the gas knew the story of the silent woman. <laughs>